Hi, I'm Dr Ian Coates and I'm the head of the curatorial centres here at the National Museum of Australia and I'd like to welcome you to our next Live at the Museum uh, program. We're really excited today because we're going to be talking to the authors of a fantastic book um, on the Barbarous Coast. And um, we've got Harold Ludwig up in Cooktown at the uh, Cooktown Museum. Hi, Harold. And we've got Craig Cormack here, who's the other author in the studio in Canberra. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners um, of the land on which we meet here in Canberra, the Ngunnawal, Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And I'd like to pay our respects to the traditional owners, past, present and emerging. And we've also got something pretty special now. We've got a uh, welcome to the Cooktown area from the school captains of Hopevale School, Garangi and Mackenzie, who are going to give a welcome in language. Thanks, guys. Over to you. That's awesome. Fantastic. Um, now, a bit more about the authors. Um, Craig uh, Cormack here, who um, is uh, an awesome uh, writer, beginning as a science communicator and publishing over 30 books of fact and fiction. Uh, I'm also very jealous of all the places you've had writers' residencies, including Iceland, Antarctica and Finland. What a life! <laughs> That's great. And then we've also got um, a Cooktown, Harold Ludwig, um, who is very uh, strongly committed to the community up there. He's a director of the Hopevale Arts Centre. He works a lot with the schools up there. He's also working for the Cooktown Museum, um, strengthening the Indigenous perspective in the displays there. He's been an enormous help to the museum in putting together our Endeavour Voyages exhibition. And he's also a National Museum of Australia um, uh, Encounters Fellow. So the book that these guys have written is, is awesome. It's a reimagining of the events of 1770, of what happened up in the Cooktown area. So instead of uh, the ship hitting the reef and being uh, repaired, instead in their book, the ship hits the reef and sinks. And only a small group of um, the crew uh, managed to make it to shore. And then the book then looks at the life they have to lead in surviving on, in that area and parallels their experience with the experience of the Indigenous people up in that area. It's a, it's a truly um, awesome book. We're going to, um, I'm going to throw some questions to the authors, but if you have any questions or comment, please comment in the thread of our um, live YouTube stream and we'll get to those questions. We're going to begin by um, showing a video um, with Harold reading an excerpt from the book. So we'll just go to that now. Mangati. Grandfather told me how the land was formed, which was told to him by his father, or when the land was flat with no mountains, streams or rivers. He told me that Gungalu from the north came a mighty serpent called Yerimbal. From the mighty rivers up north it began its travels inland. Ngati told me that it moved slowly Naka east and Bakua west and rivers and streams formed in the deep tracts it made. Ngati said Bama, the people, were happy because water ran through the country making green grass and bush foods with berries in abundance and yam vines growing stronger. Yerubal moved swiftly from the east coast trying to find shelter. And as Yerubal moved, it swept his mighty tail, pushing up dirt, making hills and ranges. While searching for shelter, Yerubal passed through this very area, heading out to sea, making the great Biriwarumbal, Endeavour River. Travelling Goa, on the surface, he came to the country of the people whose language was Diraru, language of the Dixon Range people, where he formed mountains. Moving Tepalo, south, 
he found a wet, soft soil. This was the coolest place for him, so it was there he went underground and remains to this very day. The big lake there is now his home. Mangati told me that he rises every few years or whenever he is summoned by the people of that area. So Craig, the, the book is a terrific collaboration between you and Harold. Um, but what struck me immediately was um, given that you're, you're here in Canberra mm -hmm. and Harold's up there in Cooktown, two ends of the country, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how you met and you know, where did the idea for the book come from? Sure, thanks Anne. A re really good question. I think a lot of people always want to know where did that idea for the book come from. So I've been a bit of a cook tragic for many years, as you can tell, and I've travelled a lot of places, Captain Cook's been, and written a few stories and a novella about him. But when I went up to Cooktown a couple of years back and understood what happened in Cooktown, I thought, this is significant. This is more significant than Botany Bay. And yet Botany Bay gets all the publicity, of course. So I started planning out how am I going to write the story, what am I going to tell it, and as I started researching more and thinking about how I tell the story, I realised the Indigenous voice needed to be told from an Indigenous point of view. So I started talking to people in the community and trying to find leads to who I could partnership with and talk to several people until me and Harold met up and it was like click house on fire, me and Harold just got on so well, um, the partnership was a dream partnership for an author. So Harold, um I know you've been thinking about the, the ideas in the book for a long time. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what you saw as the intent of the book and, and what, what you'd like readers of the book to, to sort of take away from it. Well, um, I, th I think the most important thing about it is that when Cook arrived here and the reconciliation that occurred here, there's many things, um, elements and mechanisms in the reconciliation that uh, the nation should know about. Because if we are going to be a progressive nation, we, I think we should look back in history of 1770, what happened between Yapari Cook and Captain Cook. Um, and what I tried to do is add a narrative of the indigenous people that is almost lost all the time when they come to historical events. Mm, thanks, Harold. And Craig, you know, in a book like this that's a bit of fact and fiction. Mm. How much of it is fact and how much is fiction? Well, me and Harold had a talk about this and even the bits in the book that we made up, we tried to base on fact as much as possible. So the things that happened to the shipwreck survivors in this book, how they encounter with Indigenous people, what they do to survive, we tried to base that on other stories of shipwreck survivors up and down the Australian East Coast. So we're drawing on whenever we could on, on, you know, on true facts and in the story what happens is, without giving too much away for the readers, when the survivors of the shipwreck come ashore, they're, they're completely fearful of, of the land, of the people who live there, and they start fracturing. So the unity of the crew breaks apart and they revert to type. So the sailors just want to build a, a survival boat and escape. The soldiers just want to make a fort and you know, defend themselves from indigenous people. And the gentlemen scientists really want to try and understand the land a bit more. So what we find actually is this, this this, the, the topic on a barbarous coast, which comes from a line from Sidney Parkinson, his fear of being stuck there. What the people really need to fear is not the Indigenous people, they need to fear themselves. Mm. And Harold, in, in writing your, the parts that you wrote, what, what were the kind of challenges um, as an Indigenous author uh, in writing the kind of narrative that's in the book? Um. There, there was too many challenges because about 90 to 95 percent of what I put in the book, from the indigenous perspectives as well as our, our culture, is um is true. I mean, I grew up with this. My grandfather taught me stuff. My uncles taught me a lot of stuff, and um I didn't have much of a childhood anyway because I was always hanging around the old people, and the stories um, resonates to this very day. And so it was a perfect leverage for me to. Um, um, educate people about what we have here as uh, Hukki Yemitar people and Indigenous people of Australia. Mm. I've got a question for both of you. Um, I was going to start with you, Craig. What do you think is the most important part of the book? Well, I think the bit of the book we want readers to take away is, while it's important, of course, to realise there's a, there's a, you know, a white history and a, and a black history of Australia, and we really need to understand and acknowledge both of those, but as the story goes on, me and Harold planned that they were going to start converging. And so we have a new voice, a new way of 
thinking about the land that's based on both cultures coming together. And so we have the shipwreck survivors, ultimately over many years, having to find ways to work and live with the Indigenous people. And I think that's a, a perhaps a, an aspiration, um, something for the nation to think about in that big what if question. And you know, what, alternative history is about asking that, what if? I really love that bit towards the end of the book where Cook starts to feel the power of the land physically mm. through his hand. I mean, it's, it's really, really moving. Um, Harold, what about you? What, what to you were the most important parts of the book? I think the most important parts of this book is that um, how both cultures sort of rely on each other through respect um, to understand each other. And um, this is maybe what we miss in Australia today with a lot of things that are going on around the world um, as well. But um, I think what we should um, also take from this book is that the history of Australia is belonging to both cultures. And the more we come together, respect and cherish each other, the further we will get as a nation. Thanks, Harold. Um, and Harold, how important do you think is the use of Indigenous language? That's, there's a lot of it in the book. How important is, is kind of using that language in a book like this? Well, it's very important for me as a book here with the person because um, it connects me the country, culture, um, the uh, social family uh, structure, um, the laws, the customs, um, but it also reflects that the 132 words recorded here in 1770 by Banks and Parkinson resonates all around the world with the word kangaroo. They took it from here, it was kangaroo, but it became kangaroo, and now embedded in the English dictionary as a hopping marsupial of Australia. And this is something that we as Bookie Emitted people are very proud of. Mm. Thanks, Harold. Um, Craig, 2020, it's the 250th anniversary of the sailing of that ship up the coast. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the opportunity in this year, that anniversary, is for kind of re-evaluating what happened and its implication for the nation today? I think that Australia is sitting in point now. Australia has always been a bit obsessed with our past, and when when you go to a place like Ireland and other places, you know, they're really obsessed with the past. But Australia has a different way of thinking here because we're always trying to rethink the past and reevaluate the past and what it means to for the present. And I think in this year, 2020, we're seeing a lot of things come together. We're seeing um, the ex externalities of COVID push for more social change. We're seeing the Black Lives Matter movement um, come to the fore. We're seeing a lot of Indigenous writers really being recognised in a big time. So it's a really significant time for all Australians to start thinking about our own history. What, what are our stories of the past? What are the stories of the battle? Because, because black stories matter as well. Mm -hmm. It's very important that we find ways to better tell them and integrate them into our own understanding of the past and the future. Mm -hmm. And Harold, are you, any thoughts about what the opportunities in 2020 are for sort of telling our history? Yeah, well, um, just to add with, uh, to what uh, Craig said, is that um, the um, historical narratives of the Indigenous people have be, been always missed. I mean, there's always um, reliance on the journals, diaries and all that from um, uh, so explorers and things like that, um, like Cook. But um, the narratives themselves coming from the Indigenous people in regards to what uh, these diaries or journals hold has been missed. So this 2020 gives us an opportunity to start reflecting on how we can tell this story of Australia better. Mm. Look, I'd also like to ask you, you both two people have clearly spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this history and the, the, the challenges and potentials of it. But I'd like to just ask you, Having spent so long thinking about what happened mm. in 1770, what's your opinion of Captain Cook? So I think Captain Cook gets a lot of bad press. And I think we have to think of him not just how we think of him in the year 2020, but think of Captain Cook back as he was back then. And in those eras, if you read Cook's journals compared to the other people of the era, he was more of a humanitarian. He talked about Indigenous peoples as people, whereas many of the other journalists wrote them as Indians or natives. So Cook had a, a much more humanitarian view than many other people. Immediately when he came to Australia, he walked to the beach in Botany Bay, he had guns ready. 
We should remember he'd just come from New Zealand, a lot of very warlike people, so he's on the defence. But as he travelled up the coast of, East of Australia, he began to go on a journey of something, and that time he spent in Cooktown was absolutely crucial. And I'll get Harold to talk about this in a moment, because it's really his story to tell. But Cook came to a change of opinion. So his first comments about Indigenous people of Australia were sort of like they don't have any possessions, you know, they, 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 they disappear into the bushes all the time. But after spending those, you know, 47, 48 days in Cooktown, he reevaluated that. And when he got to the top of Australia, what he wrote about was really telling, so he changed his opinion entirely. So I think Cook gets a lot of bad press because he's become the figurehead for colonialism. Um, I think perhaps it was more of the um, Governor Arthur Phillip and the First Fleet, probably should a lot more flack over it. Um, but I'll let Harold tell us what he thinks about Cook. Yeah, well, um, first of all, let's acknowledge that Cook was the, the best navigator of that time, and uh, we ha have to acknowledge that. Um, and with his visit to the Wallambalabiri, the Indi um, Endeavour River, it wrote into history the, the people of this country that were here. And so, you know, when we think about um, the myth of Terranolius, Captain Cook's and Banks's journals blow that myth out of the water. So it's, it's, um, it's a very important um, and crucial part of history that we should be saying, okay, you know, we got it wrong from um, 1770 because, you know, the Cook's journals say that uh, this place was already occupied and, um, but not only that, it shows that two people from different races can come together under respect and, you know, have a better outcome. And this happened pre-colonisation, 1770. So we can't wait another 250 years to get it right as well. Mm. I think it's worth jumping in talking about what actually happened in Cooktown, getting Harold mm. to tell the story of Reconciliation Rocks, because Everybody's familiar with the encounter of Botany Bay, which was yes. a bit more violent. Um, but what happened in Cooktown, so rather than his first encounter, but his last encounter with Indigenous people was really significant for understanding black-white relations. I'll get Harold to tell us the story of Reconciliation Rocks. Yeah, well, you know, it's a, it was a skirmish over the turtles. Uh, Captain Cook was replenishing his supplies on the Endeavour. A couple of our people went on board, seeing the turtles on board. Um, and that, of course our people were the first people to practice resource management in this country. So when they seen the turtles, they knew that Captain Cook was taking more than his share and being greedy because our people practice subsistence living. So we only took what we needed. Um, and Captain Cook thought our people were trying to steal the turtle, but in the actual fact they're trying to release it. And the red coat stopped them each time, they got upset, they went ashore, they lit the grass up around Captain Cook's tents and nets, and um, Captain Cook took a shot at them, um, hitting one guy in the, sh in the leg, and pursued them along the foreshore to a place he called Reconciliation Rocks. And our people could have disappeared into the bush, without a doubt. But the old elder of this area, of Wainwood, actually stood in front of Captain Cook with a broken spear. That broken spear was a symbol of peace. And Captain Cook had the presence of mind to understand that this old man was saying peace, no more fighting. Because one of the laws of the Wineboard area was that no blood was to be spilt intentionally. So these two great leaders, Cook and Yapariku, came together under an um, understanding through respect. And the very first reconciliation, pre-colonization, happened very in this very spot. Thanks, Harold. And I should say that that's a, an amazingly powerful story, and it's one that we feature in the mm. Endeavour Voyager, ex Endeavour Voyager <laughs> exhibition here at the museum. Um, we're just going to go to some questions that are coming in from uh, the audience. Um, Craig, did you learn much Indigenous history while you were at school? Like many people my age, I'm probably the answer is very, very little. And so I felt a bit cheated, even when I got to university and I was people like John Mulvaney and others working a lot of prehistory work. Mm. But I didn't feel I had a really good understanding of Indigenous history. So I started my own voyage of discovery, I guess, mm. with Indigenous people, Indigenous authors and so on. And, and I've got to say, one, one response I say to people all the time when they say, isn't this onerous that we have to go and discover the Indigenous history of Australia? I say, no, it's not onerous, it's a gift. It's an absolute gift for us to try and understand these Indigenous 
stories and what they tell us about ourselves and our country. And so one of my very first books was published with Aboriginal Studies Press, retelling Australian history stories, putting Indigenous narratives back into them. And over time that's evolved and evolved. So I've long had an interest in Indigenous history, um, but it's always been a bit of dismay that until really quite recently, it wasn't taught in, um, in schools. These days you go to primary schools, they all know the, the language group they come from, they often have the flag flying, mm -hmm. um, they'll do often welcome to countries, you know, so it's really good to see that changing. But we need to see that generational flow right through whole of society. And Harold, I know you do a lot of work in schools up in the Cooktown area. Do you, have you seen much change over the years in the placement of, of Indigenous culture and history in, the, in the, what's taught up there? I think only recently we started to see a change. Um, when I went to school, we always heard about how uh, the blacks attacked the settlers, but there, there was no real um, understanding why, you know, displacement or, you know, you know, from the hunting grounds. So, you know, it's always like we were, were the bad people with spears attacking the settlers, poor old settlers and things like that. <laughs> but, you know, there's a bigger story to it, but no one hears it. Yeah, thanks, Harold. Um, I think we're, we're coming towards the end. We've got time for a few more questions. Um, uh, I did have a question that I wanted to throw to both of you. Mm. Um, and it's actually the question that we leave uh, the audiences come into the exhibition here at the National Museum with. And it's, how do you think we should make the anniversary of the Endeavour, or how do you think we should mark the anniversary of the Endeavour Voyage now and into the future? So, so that, that's one of the reasons I think why we wrote the book is that how, how do we tell that story differently? And so, you know, there's the canon, I guess, of Cook's visit and Cook the Great Explorer coming to Australia and sunny up the East Coast and claiming it and statues all up and down. And that doesn't suit the modern era. Yeah. So that, that's no longer a, a, as relevant a story as it used to be. So we need to find new stories. And I think in the modern world, people often look for what's the new narrative. And I don't think we have a new narrative. We have a multiplicity of narratives. And I think that's the, the, one of the better things about Australia and our history. We don't have a single narrative. We have many narratives. We need to explore those. And we need to make up our narrative of all those different streams. We need to understand Cook as he's seen from the old point of view, from, the, from a more modern point of view, from an Indigenous point of view, from different Indigenous voices up and down the East Coast, as you so marvellously show in the exhibition. And I think we need to look at a multiplicity of way of looking at Cook to find him, because I think when we look, try and get people from history and understand them, we want to get a singular understanding. And often that's impossible for us to reach because we're limited in, in archives and letters and records. And the way I see it, there's always a hidden part of this person from the past, whether it's Cook or any other figure from history you want to take. There's a hidden essence that being that historians are kept away from because they need to rely on factual evidence. Now, novelists can sometimes imagine that and step into it, that's an imagining. But the more you circle those different stories around that central figure, the deeper an understanding you get. So even if you never touch that core essence of understanding, the more different views you get, the more multiplicities you accept, the better the closer I think you're going to get. Mm. We've, had, we've had a comment from uh, Nicola. Um, she says, respect and uh, convergence. We, we need this as a nation. Um, Harold, did you want to, um, you any thoughts on um, how we should be marking the, the anniversary now and into the future? Well, Nicola hit it on the head there because um, when we came commemorating the 250th anniversary of Cook, we, you can see the balance of power only one people. You need to bring the narratives, like Craig said, of the indigenous people to the fore as well. We should be celebrating on a level. At the moment, it's still one story, um, and I think it'd be a better story with all the narratives added. Thanks, Harold. Um, we've got a question from Richard, um, which I might throw to you first, Harold. Um, what's the importance of place in connecting uh, people and their narratives? Uh, it's very important. I mean, I'm a broken water person. My language is Diraru. So I'm identified as a black cockatoo from the inland area, Wakpo, Wakburka. The people on the coast are identified as um, the white cockatoo. So 
that's a difference straight away there about, you know, who we were, ge uh, geographically, where we were from, and the, and the slight um, variation of our languages as well. Because historically, even though 42 of our clan groups were Hukuyimitra people, there was a variation to each clan of how they, um, how they used a word or what they call a certain animal or things like that. But just by using that language, we could understand geographically where these people were from. Right. You any thoughts? Yes, on I that? have a lot of thoughts. I've, I've, I've travelled a lot <laughs> yeah. in my travels, yeah. and the only country in the world I've ever gone to that had no creation stories or no First Nations was Antarctica. And you stand there and you think, this is crazy. There, there is absolutely no um, foundation mythologies. Yeah. But every other country in the world I visit, I like to try and research something of the the stories of place and the stories of land, because when you get there, it helps you understand how people have viewed the land. Because the people in relationship to the land is very, very important. And whether you go into Prague and want to understand their history, or Ireland, or Africa, wherever you go, it's going to change the way you think about the land, to yeah. think about how the local people, the indigenous people, how they think about the land. We've got another question um, from Peter. Um, do either of you wish you could have been there yourselves in 1770? Harold, what do you reckon? Um, I, I'd like to say yes, because um, when the missionaries came, um, our culture and our customs have been, you know, diminished because of uh, what was bought. And so I would have more in-depth knowledge of this, the governance that our people had, the unwritten constitution our people followed. So yes. Mm. Craig, you want to go back there, 1770? Yeah, because let's think of all the, uh, the pluses. We've got dysentery, we've got hardtack diet biscuits, we've got you know, lot, lots of things to have going for it. So I, I try and get into the, the field when I'm writing a book. So I crewed on the Endeavour replica um, off the north coast of New South Wales yeah. for um, a week. And it was a week of no sleep, of seasickness, of crummy food, of marvellous experience, National Maritime Museum. But it really made you feel how hard it was to live in that era. And as, as a side by story I'll tell you there, because when we were sitting down with all the crew of the Endeavour and we bought them who was going to survive and who wasn't going to survive, we had to come up with a list of, okay, we need a lot of the bad people to survive. So we have a real turmoil on shore. So we had to sit down the list of people and say, sorry, you're dead, sorry, you're alive, sorry, you're dead, you're alive. And that made me look also at the people on the Endeavour who died. So a half mm -hmm. a dozen or so had died of various reasons. Mm -hmm. So you've got to remember mortality at that era was very, very high, just the fact you'd die of disease, you'd accidentally fall overboard. And having spent time on the Endeavour, I'd say, yes, I would have liked to have been there for a visit yeah. rather than to, to live. So sometimes imagining living in the past can be as, as helpful as actually trying to go there. Yeah. Well, we're coming to the end of the program. We have got time for a couple more questions, but if we don't get to your questions um, now, we'll respond in the public comments on the stream. There is a question, it just needs to come slightly forward. <laughs> um, do you think that books such as the one you guys have written will spark more books using dual narrative, giving insight into your, into Indigenous culture? Mm. So look, I really hope so, because when, when we started playing this, I asked around and tried to find out, has there been any other book ever written in Australia with black fella, white fella telling alternative narratives? Mm. And we could not find one. Now, somebody out there may correct me and say they're aware of one, but like this type of book, I've, I've seen them done with Jewish and Palestinian, Israeli and Palestinian people swapping. I've seen them done with a few other cultures that are at tension and as, as a way of healing, having those two voices together. But we are not aware of anyone that had done this in Australia. And I, I hope this sort of sets a trend for people to start saying, hey, there are multiple narratives here. Let's mm. collaborate and let's, mm. and let's work together. I think that's the real challenge, to find some way of holding these different perspectives, these narratives as a nation. It is, um, it is. Yeah. Um, Harold, anything more you wanted to say before we um, finish up? Yeah, I'd just like to um, add to what Craig said, is that um, if you don't have a, a collaboration or a shared narrative, um, the book is written from a, a, 
the other person's perspective on an assumption. So, you know, you don't know if you get the real thing, the real deal. So I think what it, what we done, you know, like Ebony and Ivory here, you know, we, we actually done something uh, we enjoyed and we helped other people take it up. Thanks, Harold. Um, look, I really hope everyone gets an opportunity to read this book. So I should say, most importantly, you can purchase the book online through the museum shop or here if you're here on site at the museum. And for a week, we've got a special deal, uh, only $25 a copy for a week till Thursday the 7th, I think it is. Um, and also I should say that the, uh, the museum is open and we're featuring the Endeavour exhibition. Um, do come in and um, have a look. Uh, book first, probably the best thing. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us, both online and here in the room. And a big thank you to um, our speakers, Craig and Harold, but also a big thank you to the National Trust of Australia, Queensland, for uh, enabling us to bring Harold in from the museum up there in Cooktown, and also to the school captains at Hopevale School um, for giving us that great welcome. I'd uh, also like to mention that Live at the Museum is moving to fortnightly, uh, every fortnight, and invite you to, encourage you to join us on the 13th of August, uh, and we'll be talking about sky stories and astronomy um, with astrophysicists Peter Swanton and Dr Brad Tucker, and again looking at kind of Indigenous stories and non-Indigenous stories. So that'll be the next thing, so do please join us, and thank you Craig and thank you Harold and wish everyone well. <laughs>